Here we go. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to this Open Security Summit session in March 22. Uh, 2022, we have one of my favorite people in the world, Jim Manico, uh, showing his super energy and, and using his own words, going to show you how the sausage is made. So, Jim, over to you. What's up, Dennis? <laughs> Come on, Dennis, show me what you got. Show me what you got, Dennis. You can't just uh, sit there. No, my wife is a dancer, man. I'm, I'm the drummer, remember? Let's go to music. Go to music. <laughs> All right. Alexa, quiet, please. There we go. Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> I'm, I'm the drummer, remember? <laughs> you should know the beat then. You should. Dun, dun, yeah. dun. One, <laughs> two, three. All right. It's all right. All right. Uh, over to you. Hey, you know, you know what? What I like about you is that you have an idea and then you go do it. This Open Security Summit is something really special. It's really important. And I really appreciate the effort you've done to, to make this happen. And I'm happy here to speak to you. Cool. All right. You on, we are on recording. Over to you, Jim. So we're doing this. Okay, yes. I, I want to talk to you about the OWASP top 10. I already gave a talk at the earlier Open Security Summit with you know my, my standard shtick and my standard details in the OWASP top 10. But more important than going through my slides, I want to show you like how the sausage is made, so to speak. I want to show you like what I would do and wh what resources I go look at to build my own content for my own understanding, for training purposes, to point developers at, and, and these projects that are ongoing th that I care about, I, I, I like tools, I like conferences, I love giving talks, but what really like excites me, what really gets me gets me dancing is, is, are, is knowledge, right? Is being able to take this mammoth complexity that is that this mammoth complexity that is application security and codify it in either ASVS as a standard or in the proactive controls as a, as a, as a complement to the OWASP top 10 or in, uh, in the cheat sheet series as like a living encyclopedia. And I wanna take you on a tour of some of these artifacts that I think you should be reading, you should be distributing, and you should be helping make better in a variety of different ways if you have, uh, if you have knowledge and skills in this area as well. So, so let's, let, let's go take a look at this. Now, first of all, what I'm talking about again is the OWASP top 10. This is a, the de facto industry standard on web security. It's not really a standard, but it's often cited as one. And I wanna thank Andrew Vanderstock, Torsten Giggler, Neil Smithline and Brian Glass for the work they do around data collection and analysis and the creation of the OWASP top 10 the last few cycles. These are, this is a fantastic team. There, this is not a, I, don't, I feel there's almost no bias here. The OWASP top 10 is, is built by the community. There's four leads who are just doing their best to make the project as, as, as good and data-driven and, and as listening as possible. All the work is done in GitHub now. It's a very transparent project where there's nothing happened behind closed doors. All the pieces, the research, the data collection, it's all exposed. And I wanna be clear, the OWASP top 10, it's, it's for awareness. What I want you to do is move towards the ASVS. And that's, I'm going to like use this OWASP top 10 talk to talk about the ASVS. So the first category really that we see in the OWASP top 10, which I think is wise, is broken access control. All right, let's go behind the scenes now. Let's, let's break out of that PowerPoint and let's go take a look at, let's go take a look at where to go. So you got, we got, I'm a, I'm a duck duck goer, but that doesn't matter, right? I'm, I'm in a browser. This is all, this is the portal to my world of research here. So I'm going to start by going to the OWASH cheat sheet series. I want to show you what we have available there. This is the living encyclopedia when it comes to uh, secure coding knowledge. I want to thank the literally the hundreds of volunteers who helped me work on this over the time. I want to thank Elar Lang who helped build a lot of automation for this. I want to thank Robin for dealing with me being an authoritarian, brutal leader at times. Sorry about that. I want to thank um, my other co-lead that was brutal authoritarian leader. That's not what OS is about, people. People make mistakes. So well, anyways, the OS cheat sheet series, uh, where are we going? We're going to the cheat sheets. And we want to start by looking at the different access control ones, right? So you'll see that there's that there's the authorization cheat sheet. This is the successor to our original work. And I love the detail in here. They're going to talk about the principle of least privilege. 
deny by default. This is a, a, an issue around exception handling. We'll talk about to validate permissions on every single request. I love access control as a filter, as we see in this section here. Thoroughly review the authorization logic of chosen tools and technologies, implementing custom logic if necessary. And so, yeah, I, 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 I don't have a lot to say on this one, but a lot of the access control layers in the cloud are less programmatic and more configuration. And they're saying, use, use your, your, your chosen tool and technology, your chosen access control system, and only do custom if necessary. I don't like this one. I'm going to add to this because very often the default authorization capabilities of your framework are not enough. They rarely implement like indirect object reference, for example. That's the numeric. I change a number in a URL, see other people's data. I don't see a lot of frameworks handling that AWS and similar. So I would probably say use the base authorization logic of your choosing uh, tools and tech and implement uh, custom logic where necessary. I wouldn't say if necessary, it's almost always necessary. So there you go, there's my edit. One word, change it to where and I'm good. All right, moving on. I, I'd, ra I'd rather you move to attribute-based access control, stop hard coding roles. Ensure lookup IDs are not accessible even when guessed or cannot be tampered with. Yeah, if you're gonna start iterating through numbers in a URL or I can guess a value in a URL, that alone should never give me access. Enforce authorization checks on static resources. Sure. Um, what else? That's enough for now. But this is this is the main guide that I really want you to read to understand access control from a more thorough point of view. Let's also go to the OWASP ASVS over at GitHub for a second. Again, these are the two projects I I, I, I care about the most. These are the ones I work on myself, and just the ones I believe it's they're knowledge based. I'm a knowledge, that's what I do, Dennis. I'm a knowledge broker, man, as best I can. And I, I just, I, I love the fact that this is taking what used to be expensive esoteric knowledge and giving it out to everybody. So what is this, Dennis? This is where I take my personal intellectual property around secure coding that I teach and try to give it to the world. So you're not mad at me for being a capitalist. No one's perfect, Dennis, come on, it's okay. Let's move on. What am I doing here? Dennis, we're looking at access control. These are the ASVS bleeding edge requirements for access control. And, and as I go, what the heck, as I go, I'm going to chat these out in, in the Zoom I'm in as a speaker. I'm not sure that may help. That may not help at all, but I'm going to do it anyways. So I feel like I'm doing something meaningful with my life as I give this talk, Dennis. So those are the two resources for A1. And this is the same stuff codified in clear requirements. Dennis. Remember, as consultants, we charge like 20 grand to build someone a secure coding standard. That's crazy. Those times are over. You can use this and fork it on your own. So let's take this esoteric knowledge and give it to everybody, Dennis, damn it. Verify that you're using a trusted service layer for access control, not client side. Verify that all your attributes and policy information it cannot be manipulated. It's server side data that drives policy. Use the principal least privilege. Verify that when there's an exception, your, your access controls are failing in a secure way. You make sure you're, you're not vulnerable to indirect object reference. And a lot, a lot of those damn access control frameworks in the cloud and similar don't address this well. Very few languages that have access control address this well. It's 2022, still a problem. I'm very frustrated, Dennis, very frustrated that indirect object reference is still a common problem. Cross site request forgery. It's in the wrong low. I don't think, I don't even like CSERF in the access control category. Um, a cores, right? This is a, a web messaging. If you're going to post message, make sure the receiver of that message through web messaging and inter inter frame communication that they're verifying the origin. I love it. Really esoteric, but it's, it's a good one. 431, verify admin interfaces, use multi-factor. That's a little, a little like, it's not really access control per se, but I would say that admin interfaces should have some kind of isolation. Dennis. Here's a question for you. You know, I talk about the cloud, right? And the next go, level go. of ASVS, right? Don't, don't you think that we need to start to have some native support from the cloud providers on detecting this? And, and especially how a lot of the application- On, on indirect moving. object reference, right? Indirect object yeah. reference? 
Well, now, a, a lot of these on SES, right? I would say like, a, 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 there's a lot of applications today that the code is not just a code, for example, in a, in a module, the code is a combination of seven or eight or 10 cloud services that are all glued together. So yeah. for example, like if you use one of the cloud providers and they have a gateway, now a lot of your initial web services is being created and maintained by this gateway. And, oh, and a lot of the security should be done there, right? Oh, and, you better and, believe it. Dennis, there's a reason that access control is number one on the OWASP top 10 in a pretty yeah. epic way. Now, think about this though. We've known about access control probably since the late 60s and 70s. This is when Salter and Schroeder out of MIT and yeah. some of the original multi multi user systems at MIT are building are, are being built and we need access control for the first time for real. And they write the principal Reese privilege is getting coined just like 50 years ago, 50 years ago, we knew about this stuff. And why yeah. is it number one on the OWASP top 10 Dennis, because it's the ultimate business logic layer. Everybody's access control policy is different, yep. yet we're using scanners to do testing. Which scanner really understands your access control policy out of the box, Dennis? That would yeah. be none of them. Yeah. So, well, this is app. What's that? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the number one problem. So hang on for a second here. My screen just went red and I don't even know why. What's going on here, Dennis? So, it, so, so. So I agree that access control is problematic. I agree that the cloud is not addressing it in a in a in a thorough way. And I agree that we really do need a kind of unified access control cloud based solution that handles indirect object reference and similar in a robust way. So I, and we don't have that very much yet. We have some access control identity ish products that are that are function level access control, but rarely the granularity that enterprise software needs. Because yeah. what, what you need in that level is a graph, right? Because you need to be able to think in graphs you need to connect the dots in, in a graph way that is also native. And I, I do think that the cloud providers have a good responsibility here because they already solve some very nice problems. So for example, you can already do some amazing authentication with the cloud. Absolutely. Provider, oh, I agree. Right? So I'm, I'm not I'm not worried about authentication. That's yeah. that's becoming like commoditized so quickly that it's 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 less less of a concern in my world. Yeah. But that, but there you go. So but but that's a good example of you, you haven't really gone into the worldly maps world, right? I think it's something that you still uh, you need to you need to get 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 more into it. But it's about that commoditization, right? It's about making those things um commodities and the same in this case the same way that you got authorization being um you know, authentication sorry being commoditized by some of the providers you you know things like access control the more the better you can expose the objects the better you can then start to implement them and enforce them yeah. at the now, top Dennis, level and i'm with you now go go on a little trip with me i want you to take that same idea with me as we go into cryptographic failure, A2 in the OWASP top 10. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's why I'm I'm actually really excited about, about this category, right? Because number one, it's one of the it's one of the critical categories we need for data protection. We used to call this sensitive data protection. Now yeah. we're calling it cryptographic failure because that's the real root cause. Why I think things are getting better is because, like, especially Azure. Azure will let me do like key will let me do key management and other extremely robust capabilities um, within the world of cryptographic storage. And I get it out of the box. That's the thing, right? I get it like directly out of the box in one shot. And it usually would take me massive amount of resources to build these kind of capabilities. And yeah. that's, that's just not the case anymore. I have all these components available to, to succeed at this. And now I also want to show you where I'm going to do my research for this. Let's, let's look at what, let's again, look what we have at OWASP. At 5.0 English, this is the bleeding edge of ASVS, we have our cryptography section. And if you take a look at, I'm, I'm not going to go through these, this will take too much time, but you can see them. If you're with me, you can see them in chat over here as well. Mm -hmm. And 
Dennis, please forgive me. Zoom is crashing out on me over and over again. I don't know why. I just updated to the latest Zoom. I might be out of sync with your server, but I'm getting I'm getting totally like I'm, I keep stopping the share screen on the on purpose. I'm getting a red screen. It's blocking my ability to even see my screen. Yeah. Get some Zoom errors, Dennis. Well, that's okay. We're gonna keep going at the cheat sheet series. Let's go to the main cheat sheet series page. We have a lot of, I think, rel relatively mature information on cryptography. So first you'll see we have the, where is it? There's the, the, the uh, TLS cipher swing, TLS cipher swing, TLS cipher string configuration. We're pointing to SSL config over at Mozilla, which is one of the best TLS configurators. I just pick my, the different servers I'm using and it will spit out a config file for me to to make to make sure I'm doing a, a, a good job at, at configuring my server right that's a really powerful uh, Mozilla guide you'll see yeah. ser you'll see several other different um, references that have been matured over the years like the cryptographic storage cheat sheet there's also the uh, a, a, a more uh, yeah there it is a transport layer protection cheat sheet there's like a book's worth of information at the cheat sheet series about how to configure how to do cryptographic storage in a robust way yeah by the way on on this on on, on asvs do have, have you seen the work that mario platt has been doing on um asvs user stories i just no, put I the link been, there that sounds fantastic tell me i about just put it. the link there it's, it's pretty amazing I, I just put the link there if you want to so basically what mario platt is doing he's a great guy uk base he's he's trying to create user stories uh i put the link in there if you want to Quicker, take a look. It's on Zoom. I put on the chat. Maybe I'll put it again. So if you want, if it doesn't show up, um, it, you get Dennis, it. Dennis, I can't. I, my screen keeps blacking out. There, there, yeah. I'm getting critical Zoom failures for some reason. Do you want to? Do you want to email me the presentation quickly, the PDF? Apps. Uh, I don't have a present. I don't really have a presentation. Well, you are doing a presentation, man. I have like five. I just have five slides. So I'll, I'll I'll give it to you right now. One sec. Just share it. I can, I can share my screen. Uh, uh, we're going on the log. I know we're live right now, Dennis, but what I, I but I, I can't do this. Zoom is breaking on me and, and badly. Yeah. And and I, I'll keep going, but my request is hello, live audience. My request <laughs> is we do, we do this again when 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 we're in yeah, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. Zoom this morning. I think my sir. I think for some reason, like the service and my clients out of date. But yeah, I, it, have, hello, it everybody. happens, man. It happens. So let me just actually show, show you this because it's really cool. Can you see my screen? So this so is well, definitely buddy. something you should I'm, check I'm it out. I'm gonna give you a copy of my presentation per your request though. Yeah. If you email me, I'll uh, email the PDF. You see it right in chat. There it is right in chat for you, Dennis. Can you? Uh, okay. I'll, 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 ASVS user stories, that's great. But I wanna show them the, the ASVS cryptography section five requirements. That, that's, the, that's the heart of what we want people looking at. And then we're going to A3, Dennis. We're going yeah. to A3. And here's the thing. I just literally, I got the same thing that you had. So there's, I think there's a, maybe a problem with this, I don't know, this session of Zoom or something, right? Um, but because th this is what I was, I was talking about, the ASVS user stories. Can you see? And he's basically been creating this. And then he creates the user story to actually to put into ASVS. So that you can do the controls and almost like make it super easy for the developers awesome. to, to oh, implement it. That's great. So definitely it. check it out. All right, let me let me grab your presentation and then I'll I'll share it to see if I can share it from, from my side. And uh, um, what I want, Dennis, is go to the ASVS and we're go we're gonna go through the crypto requirements. Okay, cool. All right, give me a second. Right, sorry, I'm sorry, we're going to, we're we're gonna flash A3 injection and go look at the ASVS injection requirements. And go look at the ten different uh, cheat sheets on injection. Was my intention. Cool. All right, I can do that. Where am I go? You want to go to go to GitHub? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stable release, right? No, no. Uh, go to yeah. There it is. GitHub repo. You want so five, go back, right? Go back to the root ASVS directory, please. Yeah, so and there. Four O was oh, the wait, last master. There you go. There it five, is. Right? There you go. If you go to the five O branch. Oh look, I got this. Look, I got the same problem as you do, man. Yeah. I'm, what the hell? It's so maybe there's a bigger problem with Zoom, man. Look, it's a big problem with Zoom today. Yeah, it's exactly. Not just... Zoom is broken. There you go. We broke yeah. Zoom, man. 
I'm innocent. See, I, I'm, I'm now. See, you, you test once, test twice. This is not coincidence. It's not coincidence. The point I'm, Dennis, the point I'm trying to make in this talk, like why am I even at this talk, someone said, and I agree with you. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that when you're going through the OWASP top 10, it's a great initial look at these very broad and sometimes narrow categories, right? But what I want you to do as a, as a developer, as a researcher, is to keep digging deeper into this knowledge. And you got the cheat sheet series, injection alone, we have like 10 different cheat sheets on SQL injection, LDAP injection, command injection, and each of these, and cross-site scripting, which is a, which is, and there's like 10 cheat sheets on that. This is a very specialized form of injection. That's where AppSec happens in that level of detailed nuance and engineering understanding around how to actually build software. When we look at the ASVS, right? There's a huge section on, on data handling and you'll see SQL injection, command injection, a whole section on user interface security. Now here's a clear list of requirements you can add to your projects. And here's an explanation of those requirements in an encyclopedia. And it's not just like published once and pushed out every few years. This is, these are all living documents that we're working on on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. When we look at the next category, that, that's injection, right? When we go up to A4 in the OWASP top 10, what are we looking at? At A4, in the OWASP, we're looking at insecure design. And I, I really think that both ASVS and the cheat sheet series addresses this in a very light way, right? We, there's a cheat sheet on it, but what is even more impressive is I like the work of Avi Duglin. I like the work of Tony UV in Atlanta with Pasta. And I, I do like the, the main threat modeling entry pages at OWASP with a lot of different discourse on it. The problem with threat modeling is, Dennis, it's not like a dedicated security category like SQL injection. I can do one cheat sheet on SQL injection, we're done and we mostly agree on it. But when we look at Avi Duglin, we look at Tony UV, we go look at Adam Shostak, they all have radically different philosophies on what threat modeling really is and how to do it. Now, this is interesting, Dennis. This is because threat modeling in general is still at the early stages of our understanding. If we had threat modeling as a clear engineering process, there wouldn't be all this variance in approach. So I do like A4 in the OWASP top 10. I do like the fact that secure design Secure design matters. And I like the fact that we're starting to take it more seriously, but we're still immature at it, or there wouldn't be so much radical variation in how different consultancies and different companies approach it. But let me add you a data point there, which is also the fact that there's, there's a movement at the moment. A lot of the agile, a lot of the teams who are shipping code very fast, I oh, think yeah. they're making a strategic mistake, which is they're saying documentation, uh, is not needed. Architecture diagrams is not needed. Um, mappings, a lot of the time to understand what's happening is not needed. And it's, I think it's a, it's a false economy because you ask the developers or the engineers in those teams and say, would you like to have up-to-date documentation? Would you like to have up-to-date diagrams? Would you like to understand how this thing actually works? And they will say it. So I actually would argue that yeah. security can play a good pl a game here where we say, look, let yeah. us buy the fight to create those documents. Now, hang on for a second, slow down. You're too old. You're thinking that you need to sit and make a diagram. And that's not how the world works anymore. No, no, but it needs to be made dynamic. No, 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 let me finish. Let me finish, damn it, Dennis. That's how, that's how, by the way, if you work with it, that's how you handle Dennis. He needs, he needs the rod. <laughs> so hang on, hang on for a second. Why would you go and build documentation or, or diagrams from hand when I can use advanced threat modeling tools and point at a GitHub repo and auto-generate my diagrams oh, for yeah, me? That's how you do it. Why? The whole point I'm trying to make is, is that we're in the movement not called threat modeling. That's security people. The movement that developers are in is called DevOps. And that's about shipping code fast with the responsibility of having mammoth automation around it, right? So when I'm checking in code, I should go through a gauntlet of security testing and be able to go live right away. But after I'm live, we'll run slower scans and similar. And if I want to do threat modeling, having me wait for you to finish it, that era is over. 
I am not going to wait for you to do diagrams or, or talk to me in a meeting. That era is over, but I'll build automation so I can auto generate diagrams and be able to do very rapid automated and, uh, and, uh, types of design review. That's the direction threat modeling is going in the era where we're sitting in a room building diagrams for two weeks before we release that era is over and it's always going to be over. So in order, oh, to take, in order to take these ideas of the manual processes that were so good in security back in the day, you just automate the heck out of them so we can iterate rapidly in a DevOps centric life cycle and we're good to go. Dennis, let me finish my talk, damn it. Let me, let me move on here. The next thing I want to talk about is A5 security misconfiguration. I'm going to talk about it very briefly. Again, there, th this is a topic that is so broad, it's difficult to make slides on it because what do you want when you're, it's, it's difficult to build content on this. What do you want? Security misconfiguration of AWS? Security misconfiguration of Azure, each of those are totally different topics. Or security misconfiguration of an XML parser to stop XML attacks, or security misconfiguration of my operating system before I go live, or security misconfiguration of Tomcat or some app server. So I love this category. It's meaningful, but think of A5 security misconfiguration as its own top 10. The top 10 things to configure for security we could easily do that because it's too broad of a category. A6, vulnerable and outdated components. OWASP takes this on like dead center. We have multiple cheat sheets on this topic. There are multiple ASVS and mo the mobile application security standard has like four requirements that covers third-party components in some way. We have OWASP dependency check. Everyone's freaking out about this topic. We got the S bombs. We got Steve Springlet with dependency track. What's up, Steve Springlet? What's up, S bomb people? There is so much effort going into vulnerability and outdated components that I'm a little less worried about it. It's my number one on the OWASP top 10, but Log4J did this thing called raising awareness, the log for shell vulnerabilities. Log for shell. That was one of my high school students, Free Wortley, Lunasec. I advise his company. He's sitting at one of my customers' house deciding to go live on this because he saw Chinese Twitter talking, actually doing live exploitation. And it was spreading exponentially. So he went live. It's a small world. But third party components, we have enough really intelligent people looking at this right now. I think we're doing a good job. You know what my answer to this is overall? Use less third party components, damn it. It's too big of a problem. And nobody wants to hear that, but you heard it from me first. Use less third party components unless there's a strong business case to use them and stop the madness, have a better betting process and get rid of the ones you don't need. A7, Dennis, identification and authentication failures. This problem, it, this issue has dropped from like A3 in the OWASP top 10 down to A7 because we have identity providers, standard authentication and frameworks. It's built into the cloud in extremely robust ways. It's configurable. So I think the big thing about A7 identification and authentication failures is you really shouldn't be building authentication by, by yourself anymore. You should be using somebody else's layer that's robust and up to date, can handle things like uh, our modern, <laughs> Password modern password policies and similar. I'm almost done. We're looking. It, it, so again, I worry less about identity providers because we have so much maturity in that area. Yeah. A8, software and data integrity failures. Now, this is an area where OWASP content and ASVS standards are radically lacking. We don't have a standard about, like the, the heart of this, of this category is when you're, downloading a script to run in your CI CD pipeline. You probably do this quite a bit. What checks do you have that that is really a legit script that you should be running as root on one of your DevOps servers? Mm -hmm. and, and what I recommend is the rule of two, Dennis. When I'm pulling that, and this is, this is something we do a lot. When someone pulls down a script and runs it on my, and runs it on my server, I want to double check the hash of that script against the published hash for that script, but that would have still, uh, that would have still 
like own my system from the last couple of incidents, where if I took that script and compared it to a public GitHub repo or similar, I'm going to see that it was compromised. So I don't know what the two is, but when, I, when it comes to running scripts in my pipeline, I'm always looking at the rule of two. Give me two different ways to verify this script before I run it. And, I'm, and that's the best I got today. The other thing is a lot of these hits like SolarWind, even if you were checking the hash of your download or similar, you still would have got popped. So I think to some degree that this is a really big problem, bigger than we think, but there's emerging and more robust ways to verify what you're running. And, I, and again, the rule of two, Dennis, the rule of two, make sure you're double checking that script with two different integrity measures before you run it. Dennis, any, any thoughts, Dennis? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I gotta bring you back in, Dennis. Any, any thoughts here, buddy? I think on that one, it's, it's also about the environment. Like I, I think you, you mentioned a great point, which is that everything is code. So we need to apply our principles to everything. So a lot of people like don't, they don't take their pipeline seriously. I, I, I love the fact that you ask, for example, a, a DevOps team, do you have tests? And then going, no, because our, our code is declarative. And that's the same thing as a developer saying, look, but my code is declarative. It does the same thing. So we are, if you look at the maturity of the testing in our CI pipelines and our DevOps environments, we are 10 years behind because we don't have good test frameworks. We don't have, like we've now automated a lot of the stuff, but we don't have tests to confirm that. So it's and this all code, right? Dennis, but here's the thing. Here's what I'm running right now. I have defect on one of my projects where I don't want to spend any money, right? I have defect dojo as my pipeline orchestration framework. That's an OWASP open source project. The main tool I have running in it is Zap. That's an open source OWASP project. I'm also running an OWASP dependency check within my pipeline. That's free. The, the defect dojo free from the OWASP foundation is open source software. I'm also running dependency check. So now I got a, a vulnerability framework management uh, platform. I have a a da I have a I have a DAST and an SCA tool, and I have an orchestration framework in Defect Dojo. Then I go grab SEMGREP. That's a free uh, enterprise class uh, static analysis tool. I pop that in, and guess what? Free, 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 free. Flip it on, and I have a full application security testing uh, set of tools with all three of their major categories, with an orchestration framework to run the tools on scheduling. And a vulnerability management framework and a yeah. pretty with 10 million downloads behind it so i have hope dennis oh no i think we're definitely maturity much of better around us in open source is really significant in 2022 yeah oh i i think we, we made massive progress i think now now we know and like you said the tooling and the, the open source innovation is is really really getting there the 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 challenge is 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 integrating the challenge is also scale because we, we created more and more and more software and more and more companies are shipping code. And, he, and, you know, and, and the, the, there's more and more code everywhere. So we need to apply here, these principles in those places. Here's a conjecture. I think application security scale matter is really only difficult when it comes to legacy software. But as I'm, if I already have a good testing pipeline and framework and as new projects show up, I onboard them as they get started, then starting a project from scratch with a good testing framework is it's not so bad it's the scale i really feel like testing and security scale is more prominent when i'm trying to juggle heavily insecure legacy software which a lot of people are still juggling yeah there's a lot of code being created today that's going to be legacy in five years man i yeah. I, see, <laughs> I see a lot a lot a lot of systems that they think they're modern but no, no. they better than before, but they still love some gaps on it. Keep in mind, I have, a, I have a jaded view of the world. People tend to hire me when they already want to teach their developers about secure coding. And by then they usually have testing in place. So most of the companies I interact with, yeah. security testing is something they do already. Man, and so, man, you, like, you, you like the queen, man. Like the queen have a view of the world where everything is great. It smells like paint a lot, but everything always works. Everything is really nice. But but you, you know what? I had a bit of that too because there was a time when I was doing security reviews that I was the last guy to arrive. So when I would ask where's your security documentation, they'll give me a 
50 page PowerPoint presentation on how they were secure and a 300 page documentation of security. I'm like, holy shit, I'm not going to find anything here, man, because if you had that level of maturity, you know, but that's not the real world, Jim. Uh, you're not in, you don't live in the real world. No, no, no. Right? Hey, Dennis, Dennis, some of my customers are, are actual big, successful companies. So it's not oh. like, even though I have a little jaded view of the world, it's still relevant. The point I'm trying to make is if you are, if you start a new project, which happens every day, yeah. and you already have a security testing pipeline, which the majority of my customers do, it's there now. They have security testing is a big part of mature software companies. Then yeah. if my if I am building that project in a DevOps pipeline from day one, yeah, you my, better. my chance of having a good security history for that software goes up dramatically. In fact, and, and yeah. I see that becoming the norm of software development, not the exception. DevOps no, is pretty absolutely. Big thing. No, absolutely, completely agree. A nine OWASP top ten A nine security logging. The best part about this at OWASP. I think is the application logging vocabulary cheat sheet. This is something Jet from Nike donated to OWASP and open source for OWASP. I'm eventually going to do uh, an LASVS, a logging application security verification standard of just logging events for the for the API and web uh, world. And can you so, start that one to make sure your logging frameworks are secure, or else you're going to get popped? No, by your logging. No, no, no. <laughs> That is not a logging problem. That's a third party library management problem. And I'm fucking <laughs> on that. Nobody ever thought that a logging library would own the world. Nobody saw that. That was nuts. You're, you're going to be owned. It's undermining my world. message of secure logging, Dennis. <laughs> Can you repost the URL to the ASVS material that you're working on? You know what? Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. And the, the link I'm about to send to you, Claudius, this is the current active working directory, right? So there's the ASVS 4.03 that was released, but there's so many differences in the 5.0 branch. I just I just sent that out to you over chat. So Claudius, I, I just made you a co-host. So if you wanna pop your video and audio and say hi, and maybe ask another question, feel free to. The last category we have in the OWASP top 10. What's up, Claudius? How you doing, buddy? What's the word? Are oh, you really low, Claudius? I can't hear you. I can't. It's always, it's Zoom, Zoom is not our friend today. Yeah. Zoom is, we're, chal we're Zoom challenged today. Uh, dear folks, this has been a, a cluster of a talk because the screen sharing in Zoom is not working. Yeah. Blanking out our screen so we can't even read or see our screen anymore. Yeah. Getting zoomed. And I, and I just realized that we. we, we hey, we, hey we, I can we, hear you. Claudius. Okay, hey, Claudius. great. <laughs> Ask me some questions, Claudius. Yeah, I tried to follow your presentation. <laughs> it was pretty hard. <laughs> Very interesting. But <laughs> he was making fun of me. I was trying to follow your presentation. Now, I, I'm going to help you, Claudius. If, let's go look at the dictionary and the word presentation to see what they claim that word actually means. Because we're here to achieve clarity together. The giving of something to someone, no, 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 a speech or talk in which a new product idea or piece of work is shown and explained to an audience. I hit that definition. I was showing work, the ASVS. I, I, I was explaining <laughs> the ASVS to you. You're an audience. So it was a present, even though you were trying to presentation shame me, it was a presentation. Hey, Claudius, how can I help you, sir? Um, no, I was, so you are, the thing you're talking about is really the GitHub page um, you, you sent out, so the different sections of the GitHub repository. Yeah, well, the link I sent you out, this is the GitHub slash OWASP slash ASVS slash tree slash yeah. master slash 5.0 slash EN. This is, is where... This is the list of all the main pages mm -hmm. for uh, for building the security requirements. And as you scroll down, you'll see uh, uh, section 00, um, 01, 01, 02, 03, and 04. Those are like, like the first one, two, three, four, five, six pages. That's like the introduction to the standard. Mm -hmm. Then when you get to 0x10-v1, those are all the actual requirements. Like hit v1 architecture, Claudius. What that gives okay. you is now scroll down that that's the requirement page. 
So I kind of skip okay. the intro and I just read the requirements to make sure they're accurate and annoy my other leads with, with issues I track against these. So if you, and the reason I'm pointing you here, Claudius, this is the active page that we work on, where if you want to participate and, and give us your opinion on these requirements of what we're doing right and wrong, this is the page I want you to comment on when you submit a GitHub issue against the project. Okay. And when you as a consultant want to build your own secure coding standard for your team or for one of your customers, I would go through these requirements. It takes about two hours at most and fork ASVS for your specific, cons whatever company you're working for, whatever development group you're working for and get the developers to agree on which of these requirements matter. The reason the fork is important is because the requirements about webhooks later in the project and you may not be using webhooks or there's like two whole sections on authentication requirements. You might be using an identity provider and you don't need to build it from scratch. So you should fork the standard. Dennis, one more thing, Claudius and Dennis. The 10th category of ASVS is server side request forgery. This is kind of a spin because some of these categories like authentication are hundreds of requirements. And some of the categories like SSRF, this is a real specific narrow attack. And we have a very different, uh, it's a very different perspective on AppSec. It's more narrow, it's specific. Only a couple requirements are needed to address this. Yep. And this is a this 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 could a lot of people get upset at this because the OWASP top ten items it's fair to say they're not balanced they they're not really risks they're loosely risks some are risks some are security categories some are individual vulnerabilities and you know what I think it's okay Dennis you know why I think it's okay because we're not trying to provide some kind of coherent conclusion to AppSec with the OWASP top ten. We're trying to breed initial awareness. So servers had request forgery. When you're on the server and you receive a request from a client and you're gonna take data, act on it to make another server side directed request, you gotta validate and similar so untrusted data can't reroute how your server makes a request. And we saw this against GitLab, against Microsoft mm -hmm. Exchange, a couple of major banks, a lot of cloud services had this problem. But, and, but I'm, I'm telling you what, from a development point of view, URL creation is not trivial. And that's part of the problem. Oh, it's, no. very, it's very easy no. to just concatenate stuff. So it's only recently that you start having some APIs. But, but it's, it's an interesting example because in, 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 in databases, we have a very mature parameterized queries. But for URLs, it's very easy to just concatenate things across and that creates a massive problem. .NET at least gives me the primitives I need to pull this off, Dennis. Let me just, so like, at least I, I usually want encode for URI path when I'm adding a path yeah. to URL and encode for URI parameter when I'm adding a, like a, a query parameter. So I got the primitives to do it. But and, even that, man, like that, that should be, you think about it, you're mixing code and data. You're providing HTTPS, internal data and var right all of those like if this was a sql query you would be complaining you'd be going no don't 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 validate use the queries right this is where you and i differ like at, at owasp like I, I i'm on the bus dennis i am on the bus i'm working with the frameworks that we have today to give the best advice i can in the real world of how to get this done you, Dennis, you're you're a barefoot long distance runner running ahead of the bus, trying to tell the bus where to go. And sometimes we listen to you, sometimes we don't. But we're just we're and it, both places in the run are important. I'm just oh no, of course. Both of us have our our place in the world. I'm just because and it's a brutal job, Dennis, because my job is to look at the frameworks we're using today, look at the languages we're using today, and they're not gonna switch off to something radically different tomorrow. So how can I give advice to developers today with what they're using to do it in a secure fashion? And it's brutal. The, yeah. the amount of minutiae that I, I wade through as a professor 
is brutal. Yeah, but right. it's, it's, it's the job, Dennis. And we also need to get beyond this. We need these kind of mechanisms to be automatic. And the other thing I do is I, I do the encoding and then I normalize URL, then I validate it. I still do a URL validation layer, which is really the key part of how to do SSRF defense. Yeah. When the server is going to make an outbound request, that outbound request should be part of some kind of allow list or some kind of rule system so I can yep. check with every outbound request if it's legit in, in, for that particular user. Yep. Rarely, and, and so this is it's not and, a, and that pattern you just described, right? Fix. Go so, ahead. I'm so sorry. That, that, that pattern you just described is the thing that is on ASCS. So so again, for, for the for the people listen to this, right? The power of ASCS is that it allows you to capture what Jim's just described as a pattern that you can then check. Because if you have, because what basically Jim, correct if I'm wrong, but what you just described, you said when you process URLs, the last step verify that the domain that you're hitting is part of a whitelist. That's the kind of thing that you can have on the equivalent of ASVS because it's a check. It's a very explicit check that you want to make sure you are still compliant. Yeah. It's just, just, when you're getting an in, when you're collecting data, you will eventually get to a URL or other or similar similar network protocol that's a that's going to tell the server to make an outbound request. That's the point where you have your vulnerability. So that's yeah. the point where you want to validate in some way that that URL or similar is legitimate for that server endpoint. And yep. th when you find SSRF, the fix is almost always trivial. But yep. but our, I don't think our tools our tooling that we have today does really good to find SSRF. And let's put it all together. The A1 access control, our tooling is pretty bad at finding that. A10 SSRF, our tooling I think is not that great at, at finding that. It's an N tiered multiple server type of issue. A2 through the middle, the guts, we got a lot of tooling to find that. But over, overall, I do like the OWASP top 10. It's a great yeah. place to start. Then you move to the ASVS and you move to the cheat sheet series and continue your studies. And OWASP is doing a good job at maintaining these materials to help the yeah. community. And that's that, that that's the bus I'm on, Dennis. That, yeah. That's the train I'm on and I, and I, and I love it. Is OWASP perfect? The open web application security project? Of course not. But the way that I've made my own peace with OWASP as an organization is I find the place where I can be useful, I think. I, I find the place where I find joy and I try to participate as best I can. Yeah. So I, whenever I hear other people complain about OWASP, I get like, I get stabby, I admit to it. Yeah. <laughs> because I, you know, I, I'm trying to defend the staff and defend the organization, but I just encourage everyone, you know, please find, find there's so many ways to participate yeah. in the OWASP Foundation. Find a place that brings you joy and keep doing it. I've been doing it for about a decade. It works. I encourage yeah. you to do the same. Look, That's here's something story. awesome, right? You, you know what you're saying? I, oh, right? this is my favorite. Oh, one of my favorite projects, one of my favorite diagrams out there. This is beautiful. Yeah. This is beautiful, right? This is the thing really where is. You, you look at this and, and this is all the OAS projects and how they correlate. And this is great. In fact, I think we, we tried to do this and help a little bit in one of the last summits last year. And now it's great that it evolved, right? Because this is beautiful, right? And now, now you can you can see the projects, you can see where it fits, you can see the relationship, you know, and it's a really great way to to see also where OWASP fits in your in your life cycle. So it's beautiful. Uh, it, it makes me so happy to see that because just as a volunteer, I've been at OWASP for almost almost 20 years now. And to like see like the 20 years of work, thousands yeah. of people put in to make that diagram happen. It brings me joy, Dennis. It brings me joy. And then look, going back to the summit, man, you know that the first summit was created because of the Summer of Code. Do Absolutely. you remember that? Those are awesome. Do you remember Paul Quimber? Remember that guy? The, the project manager? We we I remember creating the first summit in order to share the awesomeness of all the projects. And and the part of it was that we, we did the summer of code where some of these projects actually came from it. And, and it was amazing to see that you nudge the projects a little bit and they blossom. And now, you know, oh, 10 yeah. years later, 15 years later, you've got these amazing projects. But uh, I remember when they were just starting, I remember when we nudged them and we published them and we got those guys to do something amazing. And then, you know, it's really beautiful to see the next step. I agree. See, 
OWASP brings joy. If you, it does. It really does. If you look at the right spots and uh, keep your own like mental illness out of the picture <laughs> and try just to be a decent person, you'll be able to see that OWASP is really a great, beautiful thing. A lot of people who are just passionate about security, a lot of people are, you know, they have a they have a desire to make a difference. That's why they participate. They, and and, and I, I, tell, I tell you one thing: we, we need to do a couple of sessions. One of the things that frustrates me the most is how the new generation and I hire a lot, right? they still miss a trick by not being involved in organizations like OWASP. Like people still send CVs and it's insane. They should be sending stuff they contribute because it's so much, it's, it's actually fairer to judge somebody based on a contribution versus a CV. If I'm saying like, and I have, I have so much interesting experiences. So I, I tend to use uh, Upwork and if you know Upwork, Right, but it's a community of freelancers. But I have sure. some great experiences of trying to hire developers and other even security professionals. And instead of picking the winner on a couple of interviews on a couple of CV reviews, I will pick five and I'll give them 10 hours. You know That's what great. happened? You know what happened is the people that I would have picked first were not the best ones. What I've learned was that those individuals in the middle that might not have the best CV, might not have the best presentation, they become amazing. And I think OWASP, is still a missed trick because if somebody comes and contributes and look, every one of those projects needs contributors. Every one of those projects needs people to help. And it's this a synergy, the, right? This is Dennis illustrating our differences as people. And it's okay. I'm talking about OWASP brings me joy. Fine. I, I love these parts I work on. And Dennis is, this is what's wrong with OWASP and what should be changed to be better. No, and guess no, what? It's not all all, it's both people. of these perspectives are important, Dennis. But it's not you gotta make, I'm making peace with where OWASP is today and finding my happy place. You want radical change at all times because no you're radical. a totalitarian a... dictator at heart. And I respect you because you're, you're always trying to push things in a positive direction to do more. So rock on, Dennis. No, but look, I was rock on, Dennis. Good. Tell me more about what, what's wrong with OWASP. Go ahead, it's, tell me more. This is, but this is not wrong with OWASP. I think OWASP, is, in this case, is an amazing resource. What I'm saying is that I think it's a missed opportunity by the new generation to be involved. And I think I OWASP needs that, but also they need OWASP. So there's a massive synergy here of new talents that can contribute, can add, basically learn a lot. Because the best way to learn is to participate, right? It's overwhelm. It's overwhelming though to try to like dive into OWASP and start to learn about application security. Holy cow! What an overwhelming topic. Yeah. I mean, it's just like there's so many things to learn and so many perspectives and a lot of new tooling, a lot of new ways of developing software, a lot of new ways of doing quality assurance, new ways of engineering, new tricks, new ways of going and updating software, new ways. It's just. It is when you are doing typical non-secure development and suddenly start to learn about this, Dennis, it's uh, overwhelming. It's and it's hard to know where to start. And we're trying, Dennis. I know, but we're still passionate, man. That's the beauty of this, man. We still love it. We're still totally passionate about it. Yeah, and, and, and Dennis, I have a lot of respect for you. When we, uh, the, the Open Security Summit, this is fantastic. And like the the way that what I like about you most is. The status quo means nothing to you. You see in ways that we can do better at engineering and you push in that direction. And so that's the power of, of what you're doing at the Open Source Summit. That's the power of you as a manager. That's the power of you and how you relate to open source groups. You're never satisfied with the state of the art. You're always like, all right, what can we do to radically make it better? Let's do that. And that's that that that's important in the world, Dennis. So my my hat my <laughs> My hat off to you. All right, Dennis, that's, uh, I did an hour. This is the most cluster, bizarre, Zoom broken talk ever. But I got to tell you, next time you invite me to the Open Source Summit, I say we do a talk, Jim and Dennis talk AppSec. And you'll just, let's just like put the mic on and talk for an hour. That, okay. That's, that's what okay, want. two months from now, man. Like two months from now. I'm in, Dennis, I am so in. And we can agree on a few topics and then we'll and we'll just we'll just go at it. All right, that's the time. In. Jim High five, Dennis. <laughs> I salute you, brother. Go forth and write secure code, everybody. I'll see you next time. Thanks again for having me.